Hi, today we're going to talk about the study of the flight trajectory of a football, uncommonly known as soccer. Simply put, we're going to take a closer look at the physics of a curving football. And my name is Tabiso. A lot of factors need to be taken into consideration when speaking of the study of the football flight trajectory. It is necessary though to acknowledge that it is only through lots of practice that a good footballer can produce a perfect kick, not through the understanding of the physics involved in the flying football. However, we are going to use the physics to explain the aerodynamics. There is a number of kicks that can be produced in a football match, but today we are taking a closer look at a free kick, that is both a short and a long ball. When taking a free kick, the player skillfully gives the ball some sort of a spin. The left spin, where the ball is kicked from the left. Right spin, where the ball is kicked from the right. Top spin, where the ball is kicked towards the top. Or back spin, where the ball is kicked towards the bottom. As such, spin is an important factor in the trajectory of the flying football. Although the left spin and right spin may be involved as a free kick is taken, the commonly produced spins are the top spin and the back spin. Therefore, our discussion is only based on the top spin and the back spin. As such, note that we are assuming that a ball undergoing either a top spin or a back spin moves in a straight line since we are assuming no side spins are produced. In our analysis today, it is important to note that we are assuming that our air environment has steady state parameters and wind influence is not taken into consideration. It is also important to bear in mind that variables such as the force of Archimedes acting in the direction opposite to the direction of the force of gravity and track moment acting in the direction opposite to the direction of unit vector parallel to omega will not be calculated in our analysis. Now let's take a look at the three forces involved in the flying football. Firstly, the main force acting on the football is the force of gravity, Fg, which is equal to the mass of the ball m times the gravitational acceleration g in negative y direction. Secondly, we look at the air resistance, our track force, Fd which is equals to negative half rho, the density of air, times A, the middle cross-sectional area of the ball, times V squared, the magnitude of the velocity of the ball squared, times CD, the track coefficient, times unit vector parallel to V. This force is generated by the difference in velocity between our ball and the surrounding air, and therefore it is in the direction opposite to the direction of the ball. And this explains why we have the minus sign in our equation. Before we look at the third force acting on our spinning ball, we are going to discuss the phenomenon that causes it. This phenomenon is called the Magnus effect. Magnus effect occurs when the spinning ball creates some pressure on either side of the flying ball, forcing the ball to move towards the side that is spinning in the same direction as the airflow. For top spin, the bottom of the ball is moving in the same direction as the airflow, so that the air pressure on top of the spinning ball has decreased, forcing the ball to move downwards. And for backspin, the air pressure on the bottom of the spinning ball has decreased, lifting the ball. This brings us to our third force, Magnus force. Magnus force, F Magnus, is equals to half rho, the density of the air, times A, the middle cross-sectional area of the ball, times V squared, the magnitude of the velocity of the ball squared, times CL, the lift coefficient, times unit vector parallel to the spin axis or omega, and this unit vector is perpendicular to V, cross multiplied by the unit vector parallel to V. It is very similar to the track force 
except that for Magnus force, the coefficient is the lift coefficient, and the direction is determined by the cross product of unit vector parallel to omega and the unit vector parallel to V. Given the direction of V and the direction of omega, we can use the right hand rule to verify the direction of the Magnus force. Putting these forces together, we get the net force, which is equal to the force of gravity plus the track force plus the Magnus force. Of these three forces, only the force of gravity does not depend on the change in directions of velocity and omega. Now we take a look at the differential equations. The differential equation for the flight is given by this equation, where kd is equal to rho times area times track coefficient divided by 2 times mass, and kl is equal to rho times area times lift coefficient divided by 2 times mass. In spherical coordinates, this equation expresses unit vector parallel to V, and this equation expresses unit vector parallel to omega. These expressions can be substituted in our differential equation to obtain the following equations of motion. Now let's visualize the effect of these forces on the ball kicked with a given initial velocity using V pattern. The white trail represents the flight of the ball in the presence of the force of gravity and the track force, but in the absence of the Magnus force. Both the yellow and the orange trails represent the flight of the ball with all the three forces present. The yellow trail shows the effect of the Magnus force when the ball is kicked with a top spin, while the orange trail shows the effect of the Magnus force when the ball is kicked with a back spin. From our results, we can see that the ball kicked with the back spin lasts longer in the air, therefore making this spin preferable when kicking the long ball. While the top spin is preferable for short balls such as the free kick taken just in front of the opponent's goal net. When the top spin is increased, the ball's flight gets shortened. And this spin can be increased to large numbers before our code crashes. While for backspin, the flight gets prolonged since the Magnus force lifts the ball. And with uh, the measurements from the reference sources at the end of this video, it can be seen that beyond the back spin of 100, the ball's horizontal displacement shortens as you'd expect when kicking the ball upwards. Finally, we notice that the horizontal displacement traveled by the back spin ball is shorter, indicating a sudden decrease in the velocity of the ball. And as a result, this kind of ball is easier to control for a footballer. But it is important to note that letting the backspin ball bounce off on the ground might result in the ball going over those footballers who are as short as myself. And this is mainly because the bounce of a backspin ball has a larger angle of incidence to the horizontal ground.